Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Ethan. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 315. On Now You Know. We're brought to you by our amazing Patreon patrons. Help support us bring you independent news every week by heading over to patreon.com slash now you know, and there you're gonna find some really cool perks. We're excited to be working with Omaze to offer you the chance to win a Tesla Model X Plaid. It's eco-friendly and you can support a great cause, Reverb. Go to omaze.com slash NYK Tesla to enter. You could be driving this Tesla Model X Plaid. It's midnight silver metallic, has seating for up to seven, and is the fastest accelerating SUV Ever. Yeah, over a thousand horsepower and three motors. You can do zero to 60 quicker than any SUV on the planet at 2.5 seconds. A range of 313 miles and a top speed of 163 miles an hour. And it even comes with the 22 inch wheels. Plus, your entry will help the amazing work of Reverb. Reverb partners with artists, festivals, and venues to reduce their environmental footprints. Reverb has greened over 350 tours and 6,000 concert events so far. That includes preventing the use of over 4 million single-use plastic bottles. Enter for your chance to win an eco-friendly Tesla Model X Plaid. Go to omaze.com slash now you know Tesla and enter now. Okay, obviously Jesse is not here this week. He is on the mend. Hope you feel better soon, buddy. In his place, first time co-hosting the show is Ethan from our sister channel, Now Let's Review. Ethan, thanks for filling in for Jesse this yeah, week. no problem. But before we start, did I see that you guys got the Sondor's Metacycle over the weekend while I was away? Uh, yeah, but we're starting the show, so I think we should focus. Right, well, hang on, I gotta, but, I, well, now where are you going? Here, we, I have to go to you're, you're first time co-hosting, really? What'd you think? Uh, it's fun. Uh, okay, so I hope you had fun. Oh yeah, it was it was great. <laughs> are, are we back now? Are we, I, I think so. I think we're, we're good to go. I just had to okay. get that out of my system. <laughs> but yeah, I, that thing is so much fun and I really can't wait to review it on Now It's Review. So make sure you check that out because that'll be coming out soon. Tesla's energy division had one of its highest revenue quarters in years. Last quarter, it brought in 866 million. Now Tesla has announced that going forward, if you want a Tesla solar roof, you will need to include at least one power wall. So to be clear, this is Tesla's solar roof, the roof shingles that also contain solar panels. Correct. Tesla deployed 2.5 megawatts of solar roofs during Q2. That works out to be about 25 roofs per week. Wasn't Elon's goal a thousand roofs per week? That is also correct. So it's not clear whether this disparity has been caused by a lack of trained roofers or a bottleneck in solar roof shingle production or both. It doesn't seem to be demand in this latest change in policy making a power wall mandatory, even though it will raise the price of the installation. It'll also allow those homeowners to be part of a VPP. A virtual power plant where your solar and batteries can actually be used for the electrical grid. Exactly. I've been part of my local utility National Grids program where they use my power walls stored energy during peak demand, especially in the summer and winter, and then I get paid quite handsomely for it when they need it. So I guess now that Tesla is producing 6,500 Powerwalls per week, they can catch up on the backlog of Powerwall installations. Yeah, that's what we're hearing from folks. It sounds like if you want a Powerwall now, you can get it. So according to Electric, Tesla is going to bring a lot of those sales employees back from auto service jobs and put them back on sales duty again. Wait, why did Tesla put salespeople in auto technician jobs? Okay, so remember a few months ago, back when Elon was putting a real focus on improving service and basically Tesla was short staffed. So he took salespeople and shifted them into doing repairs. I guess the theory was that some of the simpler jobs like changing tires and stuff could be handled by noobs. So now Elon's transferring them back to sales jobs, but I thought Tesla was done with the end of quarter pushes. Well, it's really interesting that with the federal tax credit coming back, Model 3 buyers are kind of trapped, not getting the credit because Tesla shut off orders, and a lot of cars that will be delivered between now and the end of the year won't qualify for the tax credit because the delivery has to happen in 2023. So if customers could have it their way, a lot of them would wait until next year to pick up their cars? Right, and that would screw Tesla because they'd have months of no sales. Tesla is reportedly getting very strict about not letting customers push back deliveries, so the next few months could be very interesting as Tesla has to kind of walk this tightrope of keeping deliveries up, even though many customers may go into wait for 2023 mode. And I don't know, if you guys have an order waiting, what do you think? Comment down below, would you rather wait till 2023 or just get it as soon as you can? 
You know what would really help? If you'd hit the like button right now, it really helps out the algorithm and helps share this video with more folks. Thank you. It looks like Tesla's first version four supercharger is coming to Yuma County, Arizona. Yeah, according to the permits, it will have 40 stalls, 9,000 square feet of solar canopies, and a mega pack. So what is V4 gonna offer above V3 superchargers? Well, V3s can give up to 250 kilowatts of power. Uh, we don't know yet exactly how much power a V4 can deliver. I'm guessing 350 kilowatts based on things Elon has previously said. What's cool here is that Tesla is using its whole lineup. Yeah, solar panels for what looks like a 600 panel system or about 180 kilowatts. And a mega pack, which has about three megawatt hours and can charge 40 Teslas. Yeah, this solar canopy system should be able to charge the mega pack about a megawatt hour or a third of the pack per day. And the big question about the V4 superchargers, are they gonna be capable of charging a non-Tesla EV using the CCS standard? We'll have to see. Spies, I mean, viewers in Arizona, snap some photos or video while they do the installation and let's see what we can learn. So I wonder if this will become the new standard for Tesla superchargers, solar and mega packs. I mean, what do you think? Comment down below. Well, Elon seems to have answered your question with this tweet last week. Supercharger centers with solar and batteries are the long-term vision. Oh, that's cool. Look, Elon has said stuff like this before. Right. Um, so I hope this is like really legit that they're just going to start rolling these out. I mean, if these are really modular like they look to be, this could be the answer. Because think about it. There's probably a lot of places where installing this much power is hard. But if you've got the solar and the batteries, you probably make it so much easier for the grid. So yeah, this would be amazing. So in that last story, we talked about the Tesla Mega Pack having three megawatt hours of power. But now, according to Tesla's Mega Pack configurator page, because who doesn't regularly go to Tesla's Mega Pack configurator for the fun of it, right? Uh, we see that Tesla has increased the overall capacity of the Mega Pack to 3.9 megawatt hours. That's 30% more power. More power. How did they do that? Well, they didn't break the laws of physics. I can't change the laws of physics. They added six feet of length and 60% more weight, probably by switching to LFP batteries. So now a mega pack weighs 84,000 pounds. So basically they lowered the energy density, but added more volume and weight. Exactly. In a grid battery system, weight and even volume don't matter that much because you have plenty of space available. I mean, look how big power plants are. And it appears Tesla has raised the price too, from $1.5 million to $2.4 million for a single mega pack. Yeah, that's about $622 per kilowatt hour, but you do get better pricing as you buy more. So come on down and buy 10 mega packs and you'll get $500 per kilowatt hour. Yeah, it is hard to believe that 10 mega packs is actually a small system. There are actually systems of over 100 mega packs in them. Wow. All right, quick. What's the limiting factor for most EV manufacturers? Um, batteries. Correct. And according to Martin Vieca, Tesla's VP of Investor Relations, speaking at the Goldman Sachs Tech Conference in San Francisco last week, quote, for the first time I can remember, we can access all the supply we need for both businesses. Both businesses? Yeah, that would be Tesla's auto business and their Powerwall and Megapack energy business. Martin went on to say, this is the most important part of how this industry can grow in the future. If the industry can 10x from here, the supply chain will need to 10x as well. This is great news, and it shows that the groundwork Tesla has put in not only with Panasonic, but more recently signing deals with CATL and LG, and starting to make their own 4680s at Gigafactories is paying off. Yeah. And Martin is so right. Tesla is going to have to continue to scale their supply chain for battery materials and production because demand is not going down and it's only going to take off more starting next year when the U.S. federal tax credit comes back. And this little tidbit of information that we got from Martin speaking at the conference, according to Vieca, Tesla uses about 90 percent of its battery cell supply for its electric vehicles and roughly 10 percent for its energy storage products. I love getting these little tidbits of information. Uh, Vieca also said that Tesla's robo taxi is coming in 2024. And this was interesting to me because Elon kind of has been implying that FSD is coming any day now, which would then imply robo taxi would come soon after. But uh, to have an actual firm date that Vieca gave to Goldman Sachs and others is, I don't know, it seems more real because it didn't come out of Elon's mouth. Right. And now that there's a date, it seems like they're probably going to be held to that. So we'll see if it actually ends up happening. Robo taxis in 2024. <laughs> all right. I know it may not seem like a big milestone for a company like Tesla with gigafactories all around the world, but I think it's worth mentioning. You're talking about the 10,000th Model Y built at Giga Texas. Yeah, I think that's newsworthy. Congrats to all the crew at Giga Texas on a great milestone, especially amazing when you consider that this is what Giga Texas looked like on June 27th, 2020. Just over two years ago, Giga Texas was just a field. 
Tesla put things into high gear and boom, two years later, Hard to believe. In fact, a lot of people didn't believe Elon when he said Tesla was going to build a gigafactory in Texas and start pumping out cars. But here it is, and this milestone is proof that Tesla is unstoppable. And it's also proof that sometimes Elon is right with his timetables. I mean, he said it was going to be built fast, and it was. Seems like one of those rare instances where he actually <laughs> stuck to a timeline. So the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe... No, I'm sorry. Uh, I got that wrong. It's the law firm of Cochet, Peter, and McCarthy, they have filed a class action lawsuit in the Northern District of California, claiming that Tesla has been misleading buyers with its claims about autopilot and the full self-driving package. Their press release said, the lawsuit filed today alleges that Tesla has yet to produce a fully self-driving car. Tesla owners receiving the latest updates to Tesla's autopilot software and FSD beta software have reported myriad problems, such as cars having difficulty making routine turns, running red lights, and steering into oncoming traffic. There have also been numerous collisions involving Tesla's purportedly cutting-edge software, including vehicles crashing at high speeds into large stationary objects such as emergency vehicles and an overturned box truck. Okay, so I know about the class action lawsuit over Tesla's phantom braking problems, but this one is different, right? Yeah, this is different. The lead plaintiff is Briggs Matsko, a financial planner from Sacramento, California. And here I'm kind of torn. Um, I think that Elon has said that FSD will be coming shortly so many times that people have started to lose faith. Yeah, I get it. Many people have bought an expensive piece of software and it hasn't gotten to FSD yet. Uh, the question is, at each point, Tesla has said, Here's what the software can do now, and it can do those things, and people have either bought it or not. It'll be interesting to see how the court rules. Yeah, I mean, was there an implied guarantee of FSD coming soon or not? Now, look, I don't like giving press to lawsuits that don't have merit, but at the same time, I know that there are Tesla owners out there that bought FSD who are upset. I, for one, bought FSD for Sparky back in 2016, and Sparky will never have full self-driving with the hardware and sensors that it has now. Elon has said on Twitter that Tesla will upgrade cars like mine, but I've heard nothing about this from Tesla, even though I've asked them many times. So I guess you could count me in the concerned column. Right. But would you sue Tesla over this? No, Zach's not going to sue Tesla. I know that Elon is working hard on this and I'm glad my money is going to solve this super important problem. But I do think that lawsuits like this were inevitable if Elon couldn't keep to time frames. I can't even remember how long ago it was that Elon said that he was going to have a car drive from like L.A. to New York all on full self-driving. That's never happened. And... I think a lot of people bought it thinking, oh, any day now he'll switch it on and it hasn't been switched on yet. It's not like that was a cheap purchase either. That's 10 grand you're spending on something that has quite a few promises, but like has yet to be delivered. And I would be pretty pissed as a customer if I spent that kind of money and still had nothing to show for it. Yeah, I mean, today it's 15 grand. Right. Tesla has just announced that they are opening all eight superchargers in Iceland to non-Tesla EVs. As part of Tesla's pilot program, many superchargers in Europe have been open to non-Teslas so that Tesla can learn what works and what doesn't with non-Tesla EV charging. And let's face it, it's not simple. You have different charge port locations, short cable lengths, which stations are going to get filled up. Yeah, currently all superchargers in the Netherlands, for instance, are also open to non-Tesla EVs. This leaves many of us in the U.S. wondering when the supercharger rollout to non-Tesla EVs will happen here and how it will happen. If you're in Iceland, please share with us how the transition takes place. Send us some photos and video as well. I mean, I think Iceland is a good place to start another test because it's a very like controlled environment. But I do wonder what Tesla wants to see. Like, what are they looking at? Right, like charging density, wait times, probably things like that would be my guess. But it is a very sparsely populated area, so you're not going to have all the congestion issues that you would right. in major cities like in the U.S. Yeah, maybe it's going to give them false data in a way. Because, I mean, I don't know how many other EV brands are even that big in Iceland. Tesla is currently building about 1,000 vehicles per week at Giga Berlin. The goal is to get a run rate of 5,000 per week by the end of this year. To support the capacity expansion, Tesla has always planned on building out an additional 100 hectares or 250 acres on the site for the construction of a freight depot, a train station, a training center, a logistics area, and even a kindergarten. But of course, the German government wants to slow things down. Slow down there, Tesla. What are you in such a hurry about? Good things come to those who wait. So why not take a little break? Have some nice beer. Relax while your competition can catch up. That's only fair, right? You know, some companies were busy with Dieselgate and they need a chance to build some EV factories. So the expansion plan was going to be discussed at the last city meeting. But hmm, guess what? Arnie Christiani, mayor of Grundheim, decided at the last minute to take the Tesla item off the agenda. According to Germany's RBB, Christiani said... 
there is still a need for clarification. This is the reason why the development plan is not on the agenda for the next meeting either. Christiani could not estimate whether the topic will be dealt with this year. I hate Tesla. Hmm, isn't that peculiar? Either they are going or I am going. It's kind of more than peculiar. I got to think that somebody got to him and told him to slow things down. Look, citizens of Germany, get your pens out, get your Twitters out, get whatever out that you need to talk to your politicians and let them know, look, Tesla's now in your country. And if you want your economy to keep plowing forward with EVs, you need them to do well. So let's cut out the crap, shall we? How do you say that in German? Lass uns den Mist rausschneiden. As we all know, Tesla started with a very Apple-esque retail strategy of putting Tesla showrooms in very swanky shopping malls. More recently, Tesla has been closing many of those high-rent locations in favor of opening larger Tesla centers in cheaper, more suburban locations. These centers allow Tesla to reduce costs and offer better service and test drive opportunities, and so far, word has it that they're doing really well for Tesla. And that makes sense. Uh, and now we're hearing from Reuters that Tesla is considering bringing Tesla centers to China now as well. They say the shift would put more emphasis on stores in less costly suburban locations that can also provide repairs as the company works to meet Elon Musk's goal of improving service for existing customers, many of whom have complained of long delays, they said. As part of that push, Tesla is looking to ramp up hiring of technicians and other staff for service jobs in China, one of the people said. Tesla's China recruitment website showed more than 300 openings for service jobs as of Thursday. I think other EV makers should start taking note of this kind of stuff. This is all about service and cost cutting. So there are 200 locations in China that started in 2013, and I think 200 service locations is a lot of locations. I think you should cut costs, reduce the number of stations, and focus on the quality of service and repair at each of the fewer stations. Yeah, it's interesting. In the beginning, you probably needed those locations as almost advertising, but now that everyone knows about Tesla, it's not as much about bumping into a store as it is about getting good service. So it'll be interesting to see if other EV manufacturers do the same thing, where they build out a lot of like lucid air stores and then close them later or whether they'll go to this kind of central model i really don't know if that works for new brands that need kind of to be seen in swanky malls it'll be interesting to see what plays out and i want to thank cybertruck owners club they help sponsor the show so check out their website for cybertruck news discussions and community for cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners there you'll find a crowdsource reservation tracker that you can update and find your place in line and they have the 3d configurator allowing you to visualize the cybertruck in any color wrap and logo both on screen and in augmented reality. Normally, you're telling everyone about what I was just reviewing on Knowledge Review, but this week you and Bobby reviewed something. That's right. Bobby and I are kind of the composting experts around here. So we just reviewed the kitchen composter by Renkel. So I know we've been using it for a few months. Uh, I see a lot of our lunch food scraps going in there. What did you guys think about it? Uh, it's great. We also reviewed the Lomi home composter a few weeks ago, and this one is similar, but it has some major differences. Look, these units are not cheap. Uh, it's kind of a big decision. And so we reviewed them both after really using them for months to help people decide if one of them is kind of the right one for them. So go check out Zach and Bobby's review over on Now It's Review and make sure you subscribe while you're over there so you don't miss my upcoming review of the Sondor's Metacycle. And boy, I can't wait to start filming that. I mean, it's raining out now, but I'm pretty sure you're going to hop on it. I, I don't <laughs> think that'll stop me. It's kind of hard to believe how fast the Vietnamese automaker VinFast has been ramping up its electric vehicle portfolio. Yeah, VinFast just delivered their first 100 VF8s. That's their fully electric mid-sized SUV model, right? Yeah, and they claim to have gotten 24,000 orders globally for the VF8 and the full-sized SUV, the VF9, in the first 48 hours of opening up reservations. VinFast also claimed they will stop making internal combustion engine vehicles by the end of this year. Now, the VF8 looks to be a pretty well-equipped EV. So the Eco version starts at $41,000, has a 160-kilowatt motor for 369 foot-pounds of torque and a range of 260 miles. The Plus version starts at $48,000, has a 300-kilowatt motor for 457 foot-pounds of torque and slightly less range at 248 miles. U.S. customers will have to choose from one of VinFast's battery subscriptions, either the Flex for $35 a month. This is for people who don't drive as much as you only get 310 miles plus 11 cents per mile thereafter, or the fixed at $110 a month for unlimited. Yeah, so basically what VinFast is doing here is they're taking on the risk of the battery. Um, it's going to be their battery and you kind of lease it from them or rent it with this battery subscription model, which is kind of cool. But I'm not sure that either of these models is exactly right for me. I mean, what do you guys think? Comment down below. Which one would you choose? And the next batch of 5,000 VF8 should be coming to the US, Canada and Europe in November. 
And this past weekend, I was actually in Michigan for a family thing, and I happened to see a VinFast in the parking lot of the hotel I was staying at. It was in Troy, Michigan. And uh, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to snap a picture of it just because we were busy, but I was like, what is that thing? And I looked at it. I didn't see which model it was, but I was just surprised, especially reading this story this morning. I was like, no way. I just saw one. So that's interesting. I wonder if it was one of the first 100. It might be, but it is cool to see that they're out in the world. Yeah, I got to be honest. I mean, when I heard about VinFast, I thought this was another one of those stories where it would take years before we'd see anything. But I guess because they've been a big auto manufacturer, they really get their stuff down. All right. So the Lightyear Zero made by the Dutch EV startup Lightyear should be the first solar electric passenger car brought to market. That should be happening before the end of the year when they should start delivery of 946 of them. And when it's released, it should also be holding the title of the most aerodynamic production car ever made with a wind tunnel tested coefficient of drag of 0.175. That is slippery. Uh, up until now, the GM EV1, remember that electric car that they made and everyone liked it and then they crushed them all? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, it had the lowest coefficient of drag of 0.19 when it came out in 1996. But now it looks like another EV has dethroned it. And when the Aptera comes out, we could have a new record. They are promising a coefficient of drag of 0.13. Now, is Lightyear only making 946 Lightyear Zeros? I think so. Um, they cost 250,000 euro each. Oh. Uh, I went on there to like configure one for me and I was like, oh, I can't afford it. No. Uh, so I'm not sure that they'd be able to sell more than a thousand of them anyway at that price. I mean, what do you guys think? Is it worth it? It is the first solar EV, but it's going to cost more than a Roadster. Bruh. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to spend that kind of money, you could get a Tesla Roadster, which is like $200,000. And then you can install a pretty awesome solar system on your house with the remaining $50,000 and just charge your Tesla Roadster from the solar that you have installed on your house. You know what else you could do? You could buy like eight Apteras. <laughs> And those are going to be pretty awesome. And I'm <laughs> I think that might be the way to go. Unless that would you, be the way to go. Unless you need the like the luxury kind of car that the uh, that the light year zero is going to be. I mean, that would be awesome. Just imagine having eight of them. Yeah. And a uh, different color for every day of the week. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. All right. Well, check this out. This is the Camp Works NS1. It's an off grid camping trailer. That looks pretty cool. But uh, what are we talking about here? Right. It's going to have fifty five hundred watt hours of lithium ferrous phosphate batteries which can be upgraded to 11,000 watt hours. It'll have what it says is 1,840 watts of solar energy, but I couldn't find more than 240 watts on their website of the actual vehicle. So I'm a bit confused. We'll talk about more of that later. Uh, 19 inches of ground clearance with 31 inch off-road tires, steel plated under the body, two inches of thermal insulation on all sides, a kitchen complete with nine feet of pullout counter space, dual burner cooktop, cookware storage, and LED lighting for late night snacking. And what's the price of this thing? Well, you can reserve one today for a thousand dollar deposit and the price is sixty five thousand. I'm sorry. What was what was the price? You, you were pretty quiet there. Uh, sixty five thousand dollars. Oh, OK. So like so like a sports car for a mini camping trailer. OK. Yeah, I'm a bit confused here. Um, I was really excited about it until I saw the price. And until I started digging into some of the details, which I still don't quite understand on their website, it says unlock an electric range of five hundred eighty four thousand miles. And I was like, this is awesome. You you can just go trailering and not worry about range. Right. Like ever. Right. So I was like, wow, they figured it out. But then I looked and saw that there's only this solar panel with 240 watts. So I'm like, that's not a lot of solar. No. And it does have power outlets like 110 and 220. And it even will have an EV charger. But it has such a small battery that like what difference would that make to your car yeah and so i don't know i'm not i'm not sure yet we're reaching out to campworks right now for more information um because i i do think it's intriguing but i think at that price point it's just probably not gonna do it for most people no i mean sixty five thousand dollars is is a lot of money and um well i just we were just talking about apteras right yeah. for sixty five thousand, couldn't you buy like two apteras and one of them would be your camp mobile. Yeah, exactly. Aptera is going to have a camping kit, which is going to have like basically the tailgate will open up and there will be a tent that comes down from that. And you can sleep in the back because there's a huge area in the back of the Apteras that you can camp in. And it's solar covered with solar panels. And it is like, a solar vehicle anyway. So I feel like for that, yeah, you could buy like a fully spec'd out Aptera with the camping kit. And then you could also probably like install some kind of trailer hitch and pull a little trailer anyways, if you wanted. I guess. The Campworks use case is a little more off road. I guess they're thinking you're going to drag it into like, you know, mountaintops and stuff. And right. maybe maybe you'd argue that the Aptera can't get there. But 
yeah, no, I mean, let's reach out to CampWorks and see if we can get a hold of one of these tested out. I mean, maybe we'll just love it. Yeah, I would love to try it out before I say it's not worth the money, so we'll see. We reported on how Ford has split its business into three. Ford Blue, which is their old school ICE vehicles and hybrids, Model E, which is battery electric, and Ford Pro, which is commercial and fleet vehicles. Now, Jim Farley, Ford CEO, is telling their dealers what they need to do if they want to be allowed to keep selling Ford EVs. Farley said, we're betting on the dealers. We're not going to go direct, but we need to specialize. We do that with unique standards. OK, so I read that Ford dealers can either get certified as Model E certified or Model E certified elite. Uh, can you explain how that works? Yeah. So to become Model E certified, a dealer needs to spend about half a million dollars, oh. about 90 percent of which is going to go into installing charging infrastructure. So they must have at least one public facing DC fast charger that provides at least 120 kilowatts of power to become an elite dealer. Um, a dealer must spend about nine hundred thousand dollars for at least two DC fast chargers. At least one of those, again, must be public facing. So aside from spending more money and having one singular additional charger, what is the difference between certified and certified elite? So the big difference is how much business Ford will send your way as a dealer. So both can sell Ford products. But if you're an elite dealer, there's no limit. Otherwise, Ford will limit you and determine how much gets sold through your dealership. And I thought what was really telling was this quote from Jim Farley. He said, we're now number two in the US in EVs, and we're now realizing how important the charging experience is and what an important advantage Tesla has. So this is a really important lesson for us, and it became really clear to us during COVID. So, so just now, Ford is realizing that it's important to have a charging network, which is what we've been talking about for years. Like you have to have an awesome high speed charging network. Otherwise, there's no incentive to buy your EVs. And I think the sad part here is that Ford doesn't have that charging network and they mistakenly think that Ford dealerships are the answer. And I think that's wrong. OK, so the first reason is let's say that all the Ford dealerships agree to build out DC fast charging. If one stall, one stall. Let's say two. OK, let's just say two. They're all elite. Uh, so they've got two fast chargers at every Ford dealership. Well, as we all know, as EV drivers, two is not enough. You're going to show up and there's going to be a Mach-E and a Lightning plugged into each of those. And so you're not going to be able to charge. But even if they're available, um, most of these locations, Ford dealerships are not like they're on some auto mile somewhere. Yeah, like, on some two lane highway that's like several miles off major interstates. So you'd have to go pretty far out of your way to even get to these, assuming that one of the two chargers <laughs> is available. And then assuming that you can get this charger and all that, uh, what's the number one thing you want to do when you're charging? Uh, probably get something to eat. Right. So that's something you're not going to find at most Ford dealerships unless you think like a stale bagel is food. So, I mean, I see from Ford's point of view how they're going to sell this to their dealers. They're going to be like, all these EVs are going to show up at your dealerships and you'll be able to talk to them and sell them cars. But I don't think that's what most people want when they charge. They don't want to be sold something. They want to get something to eat and go to the bathroom. I just I just think this is only so that Ford can show you a map and go, look at all the dots on the map. And that will look great in presentations. But then in real life, none of us are going to want to use that network. Right. So we talked about Tesla and Apple earlier in the show. Tesla is no longer the most shorted stock by value of position. Uh, OK, wait, but I'm confused because this chart from the S3 Partners research showing the percentage of the float that is shorted clearly shows that Tesla in blue is still more shorted than Apple in red. Yes. So by percentage of the float, which basically means by how many outstanding shares are being shorted, that is true. But if you take the value of those shares, you get this chart. And as you can see, if you look closely, the red line, which is Apple, has overtaken the blue line, which is Tesla. So this shows that after 864 days in the most shorted stock position, Tesla has finally relinquished that top spot to Apple. Now, why would people short $17.4 billion of Tesla stock? It's the same reason people are shorting 18.4 billion of Apple stock. Those people think that these two companies are overpriced. And, you know, on any given day, lots of people short lots of things. And it's not a bad strategy, uh, especially if you think that some company is just way overpriced. The problem is a lot of these people are clueless. They have been constantly thinking that Tesla is overpriced. They don't get what Tesla does. And I think Less and less of them are sticking with it. Obviously, as you can see by this chart, it's it's dying out. Um, but I think a lot of tech confuses investors. I think a lot of older investors think, 
I don't get what they're doing with this new product and it's stupid. I think a lot of people are not getting Tesla bot. I think a lot of people are not getting full self-driving. And so they're just not counting that into the valuation. And I think they're wrong. All right. It's always so fun for me to report on more police departments around the world adding Teslas to their fleets. Yeah. This week, the Cotati Police Department in California unveiled their first electric patrol car, a Tesla Model Y. Yeah, the mayor of Katati, Mark Landman, said this vehicle will be more cost effective, saving our citizens money, while at the same time helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions, something we all recognize we need to do. Once Sonoma County makes the switch, we can make the same friendly challenge to Mendocino and Marin. And once that happens, we can all together watch this take off like a rocket throughout our state. Oh, and I was kind of confused about where Cotati is. Uh, here it is on the map. It's uh, you know north of San Francisco. Uh, and you may remember the Bargersville, Indiana Police Department. Uh, yeah, I remember back in 2019, they were the first police department in the U.S. to add a Tesla Model 3 to their fleet of patrol cars. Well, now they have another first. Bargersville is the first police department in the world to have a Tesla Model Y K9 unit. Nice. They saved $7,000 the first year alone on fuel, and that was before gas prices went sky high. Now Chief Bertram has 10 Teslas in his fleet, split evenly between five Model 3s and five Model Ys, making it another first. The largest Tesla police fleet in the world. Just think about how smart they must feel having switched to EVs like just as the gas prices absolutely soared. That's true. I mean, I can just imagine at city council meetings where they're like, police chief, what else can you predict? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, by the way, the dog's name is Dax. And yes, the canine unit has dog mode to keep him comfortable. Awesome. All right. It's time for Into the Future, sponsored by our friends at Henson Shaving. And uh, do you use a Henson shaver? I actually don't. I've always used electric razors, but I'm probably going to be trying out one of these Henson shavers because you guys have been talking it up so much. So I'm excited to see what that's all about. Yeah. If you want to get yours, head on over to HensonShaving.com uh, and use our code to get 100 razor blades for free. Magna International, one of the world's largest contract auto manufacturers, just unveiled their electric autonomous pizza delivery robot at the North American Auto Show. Magna has been partnered with the autonomous robotics company Kartkin to make their robot. And I guess Magna decided, hey, since we're making one for them, let's make one of our own. <laughs> I'm a little underwhelmed by the design for some reason. What, it doesn't look futuristic enough for I you? mean, it looks like a robot you'd find in like a 70s movie about the future. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, but maybe they were going for like that non-threatening look. Uh, Magnum must see the writing on the wall though. I mean, autonomous electric vehicles are going to revolutionize food delivery. Yeah, and we're kind of light on the specs here, though. This robot started testing back in March and has completed hundreds of successful pizza deliveries. I got to wonder, though, when we're saying hundreds of successful pizza deliveries, if you look at this video, it looks like they just drove it on the easiest streets to the best neighborhoods. And that's not how this is going to work in real life. Now, right. we know it uses a combination of LIDAR, cameras, and radar, and it can travel at speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. Wow, 20 miles an hour. Uh, I see that it supposedly can travel on sidewalks, uh, hopefully not at 20 miles an hour. Yeah, I, I got to wonder about how this thing is going to ride on sidewalks because it's kind of small to be on the street, but it's kind of big to be on a sidewalk. And I imagine if I was walking down the street and this thing was coming at me, I would just like leap into a doorway. Like, right. It doesn't look like something I would feel comfortable passing. I don't know. I'm just it looks like the first version of something. Look, I know you got to start somewhere, mm -hmm. Magna. I'm happy for you. But like, I just looking at this video of how it's going to be used, it just seems more like a, a college project than it does an actual working robot. Now, if it were just to be used on a college campus, that yeah. would be pretty awesome. I can imagine a bunch of drunk college students being like, oh, dude, the robot's here for my pizza. <laughs> Let's flip it over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it would probably work great on a campus because there's not a lot of streets and you don't have to worry about traffic right. and kind of just cruise around all the pathways throughout the campus. And that would probably work fine. But yeah, I don't know how it's going to do actually out in the real world, say in like New York City. I think it would right. probably struggle quite a bit. New York City. Yeah, I mean, um, because there's a person involved in, say, Uber Eats, you treat it differently than you treat this inanimate object. So I wonder how many people are just going to abuse it. You know, I don't know. What do you guys think? All right, it's time for Going Green, and we're sponsored by EcoWare, and uh, we have the Singularity September sale going on. Yes, yeah, September 30th is AI Day 2, and we are excited to see what progress has been made with Optimus. We were so excited, in fact, that I had Bobby make this brand new seat cover on EcoWare so that I can drive around in my new Ford F-150 Lightning with TeslaBot. That is very cool, and it looks super comfortable as well. It is, and it fits in every type of car. I have one in my Rivian, too. To get yours today, go to EcoWare.us. 
US. And if you use the code SKYNET, <laughs> you, you will get 5% off your order. And don't forget, we plant multiple trees for every order as well. And we help cap methane spewing abandoned oil wells with the Well Done Foundation, making your purchase carbon negative. Start positive conversations today with carbon negative products at EcoWare. And don't forget to subscribe to Now You Know to see our live stream of AI Day number two on September 30th. All right, so ABB eMobility announced last week that they will be spending $4 million to open an EV charger factory in Columbia, South Carolina. They plan on making 10,000 EV chargers per year, ranging from 20 kilowatts all the way up to 180 kilowatts. The chargers made here should be ready for shipping as soon as next year. Bob Stojanovic, VP of ABB's eMobility in North America, said the need for investment in the U.S. eMobility sector has never been greater, as 18 million EVs are expected to be on the roads by 2030. By the way, he's wrong. It'll be more. Expanding our U.S. manufacturing operations will allow us to better serve our customers and help advance the adoption of EVs from private vehicles to public transportation and fleets. According to the White House, as of last week, so far in 2022, companies have announced over 700 million in building EV charging solutions. And I mean, this is kind of amazing. I don't remember since we started the show seeing this many companies get into EV stuff like anything to do with EVs. And I think it's because the federal government just pumped a lot of money in and they're all like, give it to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, look, I love it. Jobs created all for clean energy and transportation. We're talking solar farms, wind farms, EV charging, EV manufacturing. I mean, it's truly incredible to be watching it happen before our eyes every week. And I know a lot of you are going to push back and be like, but this is our hard earned tax money. You're right. Except it was going to go to pay for something anyway. To me, I'd rather have it be clean, sustainable stuff rather than oil company stuff. So that's my take on it. All right, it's time for sunspots. On last week's Sunspots, you and Jesse were talking about that solar-powered EV charger from Solar Botanic in London. Well, this week, I came across this company, Paired Power, from Campbell, California. They make this, the Pear Tree. That's P-A-I-R. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, what are the specs? It has 10 bifacial solar panels for 5 kilowatts of solar power. That feeds a 40 kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery with a level 2 AC charger. So anywhere from 75 to 150 miles a day of range, depending on how much sun it gets. It can be customized with branding and lighting options. And another cool feature is that it can be installed in only four hours by two people. I love that it doesn't need to be hooked up or permitted. You can set it up and start charging in, what, one day? Yeah, and the starting price is $26,900. Fully configured, it sells for about 65000 depending on the options. You know, I'm looking at this now and it's a really cool design. I love how those cross members like can lift it up. And I'm thinking, why don't we just build one of our own? I, I, like it's pretty simple, right? It's 10 solar panels right, and a battery mm -hmm. and some steel and we know how to weld. So I think that'd be a fun project. Let's do it. All right. Sorry, paired power. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to steal your idea. Do you want to go solar, but you're not sure where to begin? We've been working with two great solar companies, one in Europe and one in America. If you live in Europe and you're thinking about solar, but you have questions, then reach out to our friends at Svea Solar. They are one of the largest solar companies in the world. And as we speak, the great folks at Svea Solar are installing solar panels and batteries at our producer's beautiful house, Casa Castle in Marbella, Spain. So if you live in Europe, Sweden, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, Belgium, with more countries coming soon, reach out to Svea Solar at the link below and get this, we got them to offer something really special for Now You Know viewers. You can choose to prepay your solar energy solution and get an EV charger at 50% off. Or select the pay-as-you-go solar energy solution with no upfront fees and get the first six months for free. Both offers are valid until November 1st, so don't wait. Reach out to Svea Solar today. And if you're in the U.S. and you'd like to become your own small energy provider, talk to our friends at Energy Pal. They are the solar and battery experts that help homeowners go solar for less. They're going to answer all your questions for free. Tell them that Zach and Jesse sent you. The link is down below. All right, it's time for our video contributor stories. Don't forget, you can send these in to us two minutes or less. Shoot them in landscape or Jesse gets mad. I don't know if you think it's mad. But I, I get mad. I have to edit him. <laughs> all right. Uh, good audio. And what do we got this week? We have Ross, who shared this video of his DIY electric motorcycle. Hey, Zach and Jesse. My name is Ross and I am a big fan of your show. Recently, I have completed development of electric motorcycle and wanted to share this project with you guys. The idea was to create affordable urban electric motorcycle to promote clean and quiet city transportation. This bike is capable of driving for a week without having to recharge with average 20 km daily commute and top speed 120 km per hour. 
I have developed all the electronics and software for this motorcycle. Dashboard is built using 7-inch IPC display with custom user interface. You can monitor speed, battery state of charge, range, temperature, power consumption, battery data. Charging can be done either from wall plug or public AC charging stations using Type 2 connector. Motorcycle has 1 kW onboard charger with option to upgrade to 3 kW. Charging status is displayed on the dashboard or can be sent to mobile app via Bluetooth or GSM. Electric powertrain was built based on 8 kW nominal hub motor with 16 kW peak power and custom built 6 kW hours battery pack. Driving this bike is super fun and very affordable. Thanks for watching. Now you know. Are you you tell me he built that? Uh, it seems like it and it looks like he also designed the software and the electronics for it. So he did everything from the ground up it looks like. I kind of want to go and meet this guy. Yeah. Cuz uh, we just got the Metacycle mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff I saw on the Metacycle he put on his bike. Yeah. Like and he made it from scratch. Wow. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel that's really cool. Go check it out. All right. It's time for our Patreon bonus stories. We got a lot of cool stories this week, including a bunch of Investor Club bonus stories. Um, and so if you want to join our Investor Club, head on over to Patreon for that. For just a buck a month, you can join our Patreon and get all of our bonus stories. We're talking about a new notification from Tesla, a really cool story about how batteries have kept the lights on in California and a whole bunch of other stories. So go check that out now at Patreon. All right, we're back from our Patreon bonus stories. It's time for our shout outs. Who do we got this week? We have Matt V. Adzigiri, Peter Cole, Kevin Hand, Jade Fisher, Joshua Van Den Broek, and John Crowhurst. Thank you so much for supporting us, guys. We couldn't do the show without you. All right, it's time for Elon's tweets of the week. And boy, he was busy this week. Uh, Tesla Hype said, any updates on the Steam integration? And he's talking about the games. Mm -hmm. And Elon said, I'm testing it today in Palo Alto. Well, okay, Elon, but the rest of us would like to play them too. So come on. Ilya said, seeing reality as it is and not the way we want it to be is hard work, actually. And Elon said, our view of reality is always wrong, just a question of how wrong. Trimodium Trust said, if you were able to walk around any Roman city, one thing you would notice is the amount of graffiti, which was akin to putting up fly posters today. There are many great examples, such as Socrates Taedium Est, Socrates is boring, and Helena Amotor al Rufo, Rufus loves Helen. And Elon says, Socrates can be a little boring, to be honest. Elon said, won't be long before we view gasoline cars the same way we view steam engines today. The residual value of gasoline cars bought today will be much lower than people think. And Elon said, take a moment to love yourself. And if you don't get it, that is the rock very gingerly holding a rock. Podcaster Dan Carlin said, so I confess to not understanding all of the intricacies of Twitter. I'm just trying to get some exercise in my neighborhood while tweeting a little. I'm unsure if I'm spamming all your accounts with too many tweets, though. If so, somebody let me know, will you? And Elon said, there is appetite for an infinite number of interesting tweets. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Tasmanian said, Tesla has reduced the cost of manufacturing its cars by 57% since 2017. And Elon said, this was way harder than reaching volume production, which was insanely hard. And then Elon tweeted, Rome show is underappreciated. And if you're wondering what he's talking about, it's the 2005 HBO show. Uh, I didn't happen to see it, did you? I have not seen it, so I can't say whether or not that is true. Does this get you to want to go back and see it? Not really, if I'm being <laughs> honest. John Arnold said, why we need permitting reform. There are 180 new hydropower projects representing 851 megawatts stuck in some stage of permitting, licensing, planning, legal challenge process. Only two, totaling 12 megawatts, have gotten through that and are under construction. And Elon said, absolutely. Jay Group said, we need a sweet train model. And he's talking about this, uh, if you see this video here, um, of what are trains, but the car sees as trucks. And Prasad said, a simple if statement should fix the problem as Tesla should have all the information and maps of the train tracks. If trailer-like object is moving on the train track, interpret it as a train. And Elon said, fair point, but, but I, yeah, what would happen if the, if one of these uh, maintenance trucks that also drive on the tracks showed up, would it interpret that as a train? Personally, I don't see a huge problem with the, uh, the semi trucks showing up on the train tracks. I think it's pretty funny, but I do get that. It's just like a simple fix. All right. Elon's talking about the whistle again. I guess they put it back up on the website. He said, but you do have to pay in doge. So I, I went on there the other day and, um, well, first of all, I only have 960 doge. So I can't buy it. And also it's sold out. Uh, well, there you go. Uh, but he said, we are working on making the whistle sound much louder. That's good. Very important. So that's about 60 bucks. Okay. If, you, if you people who aren't into Doge are wondering. 
Polmar's catalog said Tesla full self-driving 10.69.2 drives for 19 minutes with zero human control, no accelerator tap, no max speed changes, nothing. And Elon said layers upon layers of neural nets ever higher. He went on to say that 10.69.2.1 is coming out in a few days with additional polish. Dot three comes out shortly after AI day and beta expanding to safety scores above 80 after the dot two dot one goes out. Well, that'll be nice for a lot of people who have not been able to get high safety scores. Yeah. Elon said that salted butter is amazing, but should be stored at room temperature. <laughs> and posted this meme along with it. Butter watching the other food items in the fridge from its special tray. Nature Portfolio tweeted out, decisions on investment and policy are made under the assumption of continuous economic expansion. Thomas W. Murphy Jr. writes in Nature Physics how physical limits may soon end this phase of development as foreshadowed by the limits to growth. And Elon said, technically true, but Earth's economy is extremely far from physical limits. Energy is the foundation of the economy, but we're using a very tiny amount of available energy even if we only used photovoltaics. Elon said that Starlink is meant for peaceful use only. To help mend the fault in our stars. Is that a reference to the book? Do you I think? guess yeah. so. Uh, Doge designer pointed out that Starlink is now available in all seven continents, but Larkening said, just sad it's not available for 70% of Canada. And Elon said, it will be later this year when laser links activate on polar constellation. And then Eric had this interesting point. He was talking about uh, the Accela train from Boston to New York City. It could be one hour, smooth, frequent train ride from downtown to downtown. Right now, it's not one hour. People would routinely go to lunch in each other's cities, do some business and be back home by dinner. The economic value unleashed would be staggering. And Elon said Hyperloop could do that trip in less than half an hour, which would be pretty awesome. I mean, come on. If you took two cities like this that are four hours apart and you could get there in half an hour, I would be doing the same thing. I'd be going to shows and meals oh, yeah. in New York all the time. Yeah. Talk about business stuff alone. But then, like you said, you could just do stuff for recreation, just easily get to New York and back. I think that would that would be crazy. Come on, Hyperloop. <laughs> and Elon tweeted out this meme. Eh, good enough from Mediocrities. News from Science said, Starship will be the biggest rocket ever. Are space scientists ready to take advantage of it? Elon says, Starship will be an incredible enabler for science. Full reusability and high production rate drive several orders of magnitude improvement in dollars per kilogram to orbit and beyond. Next-gen Starlink Constellation is primary user of this rocket, so science doesn't need to cover fixed cost. And Pranay said, not many understand the full capabilities that SpaceX's Starship possesses. The Starship fleet is designed to achieve over a thousand times more payload to orbit than all other rockets on Earth combined. Starship's payload capacity will be insane, and that blows my mind. And Elon said, true. SpaceX said, deployment of 54 Starlink satellites confirmed. And Elon said, another batch with lasers reaches orbit. Starlink is now active on all continents, including Antarctica. And lastly, Elon tweeted out this very poetic, starry, starry night, paint your palette blue and gray. The first to post down below who wrote that song in the comments will get a $30 gift card to EcoAir. Just make sure that we can get in touch with you through your YouTube channel. And uh, so put your email in your about section on your channel. Yeah. All right. It's time for community mail time. Community mail time. And remember, send us your stories, your photos, your videos to hello at now, you know, channel dot com. What do we got? A reminder to everyone in the New England area, our buddy Jeff is putting on his EV show again this year on Saturday, October 1st at the Hebert Candy Mansion in Shrewsbury, Mass. from 2 to 5 p.m. And everyone is welcome to attend. Now, so far, uh, Jeff has 44 vehicles registered and Jesse and I are planning on bringing our Rivian R1T and the Ford F-150 Lightning there. There'll be free raffles as usual. I mean, last one, I think Jesse and I gave away a couple electric scooters. Nice. I'm not sure what we'll give away this time. Uh, there'll be cider donuts for sale, the summons race, and of course, the Candy Mansion sale ice cream, fudge, and chocolate. Okay, now I know I have your attention. <laughs> but Jeff wants drivers because he wants to get butts and seats. So drivers sign up on the website and there will be free pizza and drinks for you at Jeff's event. And a big thank you to Jeff for working and planning to make this event happen. We'll put the website link down below in the show notes. All right, David sent us this picture of the inside of a supercharger compared to the inside of an Electrify America charger. Uh, it looks like the EA is a beta test. Doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it just, I don't know. You can see why they don't work all the time. Also, you can see why so much space is taken up for the screens that you don't need. Yeah. Daryl sent us these pictures of a Model Y police car in Boulder City, Nevada. Maddie sent us these photos of his 2013 Smart Electric Drive. He says he's had it for many years, but has just started working on lifting it with UTV wheels and tires. <laughs> Have some more stuff to do like brush guards and off-road lights. Taking it to car meets really opens up EV conversations. I've driven electric for 10 years now. Also have a 2022 Tesla Model Y performance. Thanks for all you do. I watch every show at least one time. At least one time. Wow. Wow. All right. You're committed. <laughs> 
Cody and Risa sent us all these pictures of this wrapped Model X, three Rivian R1Ts, and an R1S they spotted on their trip to Mammoth Lakes in Northern California. Ryan said, got the chance to ride my Apollo e-scooter down the beaches of South Padre, Texas to the Southern Point, where you have a view of the SpaceX bays and launch tower with the booster currently being tested. Excellent ride. 10 out of 10. Do recommend. Awesome. That would be a fun place to ride scooters. Seriously. John sent us this picture of a Model X in South Africa. That Model X has a gas generator on the back. You need to watch our video on the Now it's Review channel about the Jackery portable battery and solar panels because I think that could uh, do the job of that gas generator without having to worry about a gas generator. <laughs> Gregor sent us these pictures of six new Teslas on a delivery truck being delivered in Slovenia. John from Saskatoon in Canada said, thank you for all that you do to promote electrification is exactly what the world needs. I also have to give you a huge thank you for your tireless efforts to combat FUD in all of its dangerous forms. Keep up the good work. I was in Jasper, Alberta, Canada in late July, and I spotted a very few interesting vehicles. The first is a Model 3 with a very eye-catching wrap or paint job. The second is a Ford F-150 Lightning. I certainly didn't expect to see one of these considering how rare they are and still are. I took a peek inside and was surprised to see a handwritten note on a piece of paper that the climate control was on and that the dog in inside the vehicle was quite comfortable. Anyway, enjoy these shots from Jasper. Patrick sent us a photo of this wrapped Model X he spotted in Arvada, Colorado. And DC says, I was riding my e-bike in Ventura, California and noticed one of my neighbors bought a new Hummer EV. And we're on the list for that too. So Exciting. hopefully that'll be showing up sometime. That thing is a beast. All right, it's time for supercharger reviews. Let's see what's out there in the world. But before we do, let's go to a beautiful supercharger. Hi, Zach and Jesse. This is Jeff all the way from South Australia. Uh, this is the Woomera. This is the one stall, one stall supercharger, or not really supercharger. It's just a 32 amp, three phase, 240 volt plug. Uh, charging up here, it's going to take us about three hours to add 60% to our car. So charging up here for a little while. Yeah, there's not much here. There's a desert. There's Spud's Roadhouse, which is petrol, food, and probably beer. So I'd give this a 2 out of 10 for facilities, but I'm actually going to give it 11 out of 10 because it's the only place to charge within about two or 300 kilometers. So charge up here, and our next stop is Port Augusta. Thanks, Zach and Jesse. Now you know. Okay, this wasn't a beautiful supercharger because it wasn't a Tesla supercharger. It was just a 220 wall outlet, but it was beautiful to Jeff because he's in Womera, uh, in the middle of the Australian desert. His next stop is Port Augusta, which is 175 kilometers away. So that's quite a drive. Yeah. Uh, Jeff has some great videos of driving in his Model 3 in Australia on his YouTube channel. All right. So let's see what's out there in the world today. Hello, this is Jim Burnworth in Inyo Kern, in California. Um, I've been coming to this uh, uh, supercharger here, Tesla supercharger for the last year and a half or so, but there's been quite a few changes here. There were just uh, four, let's see, right over there, there were four um, charging stations and uh, they just added these 12 right here behind me. And then they also have room for uh, another 10 right in front of me. So they're, they're making some moves here, even though this seems like it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but 395 comes down here and um, splits off and there's 14 that goes in a different direction. Then, um, then there's a, a military base um, out about 10 miles to the east here. Um, but right here, there's, there's not much. There's a hamburger spot and uh, the beautiful mountains to the east side of the Sierras. There's really not much here. Um, and I wouldn't rate it very high except for the potential that Tesla has as far as a charging supercharger here. Um, it's charging really fast. And, uh, but the, there's a hamburger spot here in a market and a post office, but um, they're not really high quality. And I, I wouldn't give the facilities around here very high rating, maybe a five out of 10. Um, so now you know. Hey Zach and Jesse, we are here in Lake City, Florida at the Tesla supercharging station. And yes, the one with Starlink. So it's six stalls, uh, 150 kilowatt hours max charge. Here in Lake City, Florida, again, right at the intersection of I-10 and I-75. 
So it sees a lot of through traffic. So it's really a strategic location to have it here. Lots of food, lots of shopping right here on Highway 90 that runs right through the middle of town. Um, so very, very, very walkable location. Um, only charges up to 150 kilowatt hours, but you have Starlink access. Um, really great location, lots of options. I give it a nine out of 10, now you know. Hey, Zach and Jesse. I'm here in a uh, new 12 stall at a Target here in Stoughton, right off of Route 24, a good location. And right over that hill there, there's a Cumberland Farms gas station with a little market and then there's a Friday's right here and if you go a little further down the street you've got BJ's and the movie theater and plenty of other places to eat so I think I'd give this one a nine eight and a half nine out of ten go wolf back talk to you later hey Zeka Jesse how's it going this is Andre we're reviewing here the new supercharger in Toma, Wisconsin. It's a 3678 stall with a hitch one right here. A uh, great area actually. There's a quick trip, there's a tap room right in the back here, there's a cranberry ball, uh, there's a coffee shop right at the end there. And if you're into it, there's also a CBD shop right there. There are four Electrify America charging stations as well close by and they're right behind a Walmart. So it's a, it's a great place actually. I will rate this a 10 out of 10. Really good place. It's a V3 supercharger, brand new. And now you know. Thank you so much for doing supercharger reviews. If you want to check out some of the reviews that people have done in the past or upload your own, you can head over to our website, nowyouknowchannel.com. There we have a map showing all of the supercharger locations that people have reviewed, and you can see whether or not it's worth stopping based on people's reviews. All right, so what do we have for new superchargers in the world? We got number 45 in North Carolina, the 12 stall in Boone. Number 38 in Massachusetts, the 8 stall in Templeton, Mass. The 3 stall in Jiamen, Shangri-La Hotel, China. The three stall at Xiaomen at Jiangfa Yusheng Center in China. The three stall at Fuzhou in Lijing Holiday Hotel, China. The three stall in Beijing at the Sunshine Building. The three stall in Wuhan at the Jinkai Hampton by Hilton Hotel, China. The six stall at Nanning at the Qingzhou Fortune International Plaza in China. The three stall at Chongqing Fairy Mountain Mingyu Shangya Hotel, China. Number 26 in Switzerland, the 12 stall in Kren, Switzerland. Number 140 in Germany is the 20 stall at Wuppertal, Germany. The 12 stall in Ukiah on North State Street, California. Number 18 in Minnesota is the 10 stall in Minneapolis. The 11 stall in Lathrop, California. Number 120 in France is the 24 stall at Chambre les Tours, France. The 6 stall in Yangzhou at the Crown Plaza, China. The 8 stall in Laguna Seca, California. Yeah, just in time for the races. The 12 stall in San Leandro, California. Number 27 in Mexico is the 4 stall at Villa Ahumada, Mexico. Number 305 in California is the 12 stall in Bakersfield, California on South Enos Lane. And number 958 in China, 3,772 in the world, is the 3 stall at Jiaxing Haiyan Dexin Wing, China. Whew. Got through that. Oh, a lot of Chinese superchargers. Yeah, you said something about it a couple weeks ago, how we haven't seen any of them, and they were just like, all right, well, here you go. <laughs> we're going to start including them. Good luck. Right. <laughs> now, it is incredible how many are just popping up every week. It yeah. just makes these other charging networks look kind of foolish because they keep talking about how many they're going to have three years from now. And, mm -hmm. It's going to be like 100 or whatever. And it's yeah. like, all right, well, there's almost 4,000 for Tesla. So I know. good luck catching up. All right, so it's time for our Patreon comment of the week. And on last week's Patreon bonus stories, Jesse and I were talking about Electrify America's new naming scheme, Hyperfast and Ultrafast. Ooh. Uh, so which one of those is faster? Um, I can't remember. Hyper oh, yeah, it was Ultrafast is the slower one at 150 kilowatts, and Hyperfast is the fastest at 350 kilowatts. <laughs> Our patron Jake had a good naming idea for Electrify America. How about dead fast, since most of the time you'll get zero kilowatt hours from one of the EA chargers when you pull up? Perfect. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's more accurate uh, based on your experience, especially. I just, ultra and hyper. It's like, who's going to remember which of those is fastest? They both sound really fast. Like, yeah. yeah. I don't know. 
it's kind of, I mean, it just shows you how silly EA is. Uh-huh. Thank you to Ethan for filling in for Jesse on such short notice. I got to thank our patrons. Uh, this is one of those weeks where I was like, how are we going to do this? But it was never a question of, are we going to do this? Having you lovely people support us is truly heartwarming. I feel honored that you watch us. Yeah, and if you want to join these patrons on the end credits that you see scrolling by here, head over to patreon.com slash now you know and choose a perk level that speaks to you. And thank you, Zach, for having me on as a co-host. This was fun. You, and, you did uh, great. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. And to quote from one of my own songs, the world can be an awful place, but we can turn that around. So don't forget that and don't give up the fight. Stay strong, everyone. We'll see you next week. Now, now you know. know.